the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We join together this morning in the call to worship. When we are at our best, when we forget to be kind, when we are feeling low, however we find ourselves, God welcomes us, and we are grateful for this gift of grace. We sing together in the bulb, there is a flower, number 674. Welcome to Knox Waterloo this morning. Yes, you can sit down. <laughs> it is great to be together. Welcome to everyone who is present in the sanctuary, those who are participating on live stream, those who are listening in on radio and watching later on YouTube. We are so grateful for your presence in this community. Today we continue our Wandering Heart Lenten series of Figuring Out Faith with Peter. Our focus and theme today is about learning and looking to Christ as our teacher, asking lots of questions and learning about the way of forgiveness. Our prayer has already begun, but let us continue with some words. Great teacher, we gather as your broken people to open our whole selves to engage all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. Your grace has ambiguous math that we struggle to understand. You invite us to let go of rigid limits and to embrace the limitless possibilities of forgiveness and repair. You teach us how to work together to make a community whole. We come filled with questions and we desire clear answers. Through Jesus, you provide expansive answers and emphasize the abundance of forgiveness that goes against the world's cycle of unforgiveness. You call us to co-create a world where forgiveness mends what is broken and where the beauty of repair shines through illuminating our shared humanity. Holy God, we long to be lifelong learners. We long to approach you with curiosity and an open mind. Instead, we often live as if we know best. We forget that the disciples called you rabbi, teacher. Forgive us for the times when we fail to be curious. Forgive us for the times when we assume we know best. Forgive us for the moments when we imagine that our learning is done and that we have all the answers. Like Peter, who was brave enough to ask, 
How many times should we forgive? Make us brave. In times of disagreement, teach us to listen. Loose the prejudice and bind us to your way of forgiving grace through Jesus Christ, who stands at the heart of our gathering. Spark a desire in us to learn, and may our curiosity carry our faith into deeper waters. With hope and humility, we join together in singing the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Family of faith. When Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus responded with abundance. That abundance exists for you and I as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning, God's abundant grace exists for you. God's love will never run out. So hear and rest in this good news. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to share signs of peace with those around you wherever you are. Try them on. I'd like to try on your fancy glasses, Eric. Oh, thanks, Helen. Thank you. Eric brought some glasses today, and he, want, he wanted to know if I would try them on earlier, and I didn't. So I, I thought I'd try them on in front of all of you. I don't think they're my prescription. <laughs> there we go. What do you think? Happy St. Patty's Day to you all. <laughs> Here you go, Eric. Happy birthday to you, by the way. And to Daniel, too, day after the fact. Well done, well done. 
Ah, well, I, uh, I love to see some of you dressed in green today. I wore green today too, because I'm, I'm a little bit Irish or a lot Irish. I, I look at your fancy shirts, though, and I realize, I looked through my sock drawer this morning, I do not have St. Patty's Day socks. I, can you believe that? So I got to go to the store at some point this week and make sure I pick up some on-sale St. Patty's Day socks, because now is the time to buy them on sale, right? Yeah. We're not going to talk about St. Patty's Day today, though. I want, to, I want to just tell you something very, very simple that I did yesterday. I went for a walk in the woods yesterday, and I saw something really beautiful. What I saw was a miracle. It was a miracle, the thing that I saw yesterday. I was walking by this path, and this is what I saw. There we go. Yeah. It is an absolute miracle. It's early this year. We didn't have enough snow this winter. I know all of you don't agree with me, but I'm, I'm a skier. I wish we had more snow. But uh, gosh, springtime is an absolute miracle. Things that have been sleeping in the winter-hardened soil are suddenly be they're suddenly becoming alive and. There's green everywhere now. I see it in the woods yesterday. There was green everywhere. It's like, wow, this is amazing. The earth in, in this part of the world, anyway, it's coming back to life, and it is a miracle. I love that, you know, in, in Lent, we're, we, we're getting ready for Easter, right? In a couple of weeks, it's going to be Easter. And Easter is this great celebration of new life, of resurrection, of the hope that we have in God. And I love that the resurrection, we celebrate Easter at the same time of the year as we celebrate spring. The, the things are coming alive again. I just love that. It's a miracle. It, next time you go for a walk outside, look for a miracle. Because if you keep your eyes open, you will see something miraculous. We're going to sing a song. Now, we've sung this one before, where, I, where We Sit is Holy. I'll sing it through. We'll sing it through a couple of times. If you remember it, you can sing it through with me. And uh, join in when you can. It goes like this. Where we... Mm, that's it, yeah. Where we sit is holy. Holy is this ground. Forest, mountain, river. Listen to the sound. God's spirit circles all around us. Let's try that together. Where we sit is holy, holy is this ground. Forest, mountain, river, listen to the sound. God's spirit circles all around us. Where we sit is holy, holy is this ground. Forest, mountain, river, listen to the sound. God's spirit circles all around us. One more time. Where we sit is holy, holy is this ground. Forest, mountain, river, listen to the sound. God's spirit circles all around us. And together, God's people say, Amen. Maybe, Eric, since it's your birthday, maybe you can bring the shepherd's crook out and lead, lead everybody to, uh, to your worship centers today. Great to sing with you. Great to hang out with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Lenten symbol today is open book. We continue our wandering journey on the Lenten path. This fifth Sunday of Lent, we add the symbol of the open book. 
Peter's relationship toward Jesus is that of an open book. He is eager to learn from Jesus all he can glean. Peter looks to Jesus as his teacher and is looking for practical examples for how to live out his faith. In this week's text, Peter wants to know all about the nature of forgiveness and grace. Teaching God, we want to learn your ways. We want to learn the ways of forgiveness. We want to learn the ways of grace. We want to learn the ways of love. That is part of why we return to the sacred stories of Scripture week after week, because we are hungry to be more like you. So we, as we prepare to listen to the gospel, calm the noise in our minds, center our spirits to focus on you so that we might learn and hear what we have missed in this story before. God, we want to learn your ways. Meet us here. Open us up to being your students. Help us to listen. Amen. Peace be with you. And peace be with you who are live streaming and listening in on radio. Gospel reading today is from Matthew, chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Listen for what the Holy Spirit might be trying to teach the church. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Ah, But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. 
And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. I'm just going to get this door. Excuse me. So, I'm glad there are four Gospels in Scripture. I'm really glad there are four because there are some Gospel writers I prefer over others, I have to say. And I really, really have trouble with some of the things that the Gospel writer Matthew says. Big problems I have with it. Things like the last verse of this story that he just told. The part where it says God will throw us into jail and torture us to pieces if we don't forgive someone. Really? Matthew's picture here of God is of a violent, retributive deity who keeps score of our wrongdoings and meets out punishment according to our deeds. Is that really what we believe about God? I sure don't think that God works this way, regardless of what Matthew says here. And I'm not sure that Matthew really believed that about God either, because in other places of Matthew's own book, Matthew paints God using very different brushstrokes. Today's story is a kind of scripture that helps me to articulate my understanding of the Bible and what the Bible actually is. Now, I've shared this before with some of you in previous sermons, but in case you missed that one or two, I'm going to share a little bit of this again. It bears repeating. There are those who believe that the Holy Spirit took over the bodies of certain people and led the hands of the biblical writers so that every word that's written was intended by God in that precise way, that this is how they interpret infallibility. This is God's infallible message to us. Well, if that's what happened, if that's the case, then how does one reconcile a verse, such as the last verse in today's story, with other parts of Scripture which contradict that verse entirely? In other words, Which image of God, which understanding of God, which theology of God are you going to choose? Because the Bible is full of very different theologies of God, different perspectives on who God is and how God acts. And I think that this discrepancy, and I would say it is a discrepancy, It's not an apparent discrepancy. It is a discrepancy because if you'll read your Bibles carefully, you'll see that it is a discrepancy. That this can be explained through a more nuanced understanding of what the Bible actually is. So I'm going to use some I statements and share with you some of my biblical theology. I wonder, I think, that the Bible is a record, among other things, a record of the developing insights through the ages of the human understanding of God. It could be seen as a record of the evolution of theological thought. Now, from this perspective, Scripture is written as a witness to the way the divine works in our midst, the way people think the divine works in our midst. That, what that means is that different writers in different ages, in different political and economical, economic and social contexts, they're going to think different things about who God is and how God works. People will write about the transcendent using the symbols and the rituals which are meaningful to them in their particular cultural contexts how God is described by a Middle Eastern war-weary nomad 3,000 years ago, need not be, thankfully, the way that I have to describe God. 
his or her symbols are going to be very different than my symbols for God. I think that Scripture is a record of people's interpretations of the experience of the divine in their midst. So the Bible is a human document. It is inspired, though, but I want to explain that word. People were inspired to write about God. So yes, it is inspired, but in a different way than the word is commonly used to describe biblical inspiration. So let's look at Matthew for a few moments. Now, if you read the whole book of Matthew, you'll see that for some reason Matthew had kind of an obsession with hell. There's anger, there's torture, there's retribution. The phrase gnashing of teeth appears all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And in the way Matthew interpreted the, the, the parables and the stories of Jesus. Because he received those as oral stories, he wrote them down and edited them, changed them, interpreted those stories. And for some reason, he used a lot of hell language in his version of the story. I've read, I've read that if you take Matthew and Revelation out of the Bible, you've removed most of the references to hell in the New Testament. I mean, doesn't that make you think for, about this? Hellfire was a part of Matthew's theology. The image of hell was a part of the way Matthew witnessed to some dimension of God's character. Maybe Matthew thought that, that his church needed a bit of hellfire and brimstone preaching, needed to kind of scare them into submission. Maybe it was shock value that Matthew was looking for, trying to frighten them into taking seriously, in this case, how often they needed to forgive each other. Maybe they were fighting. He was trying to emphasize forgiveness. Now, regardless of how these very harsh words in today's story ended up in, in the gospel, I, by that I mean the part where it says God's going to torture you if you don't forgive, I don't believe for one second that God will send us to torture chambers, regardless of what Matthew says. I don't think God will send us to hell, regardless of Ma what Matthew says. Because everything else I read about Jesus in the gospel of Matthew and other gospels is about the compassionate God. Everything that I read about the, the, the cross, everything that I read about resurrection, everything I read about the way Jesus brought people into community and had compassion for them, it's all about forgiveness. We see picture after picture of God who is a forgiving God. I cannot reconcile the entire life and ministry of Jesus with this fear-inducing, hell-tinged warning from Matthew. Just can't reconcile it. Not for a second. Now, that's not to suggest that those of us who aren't into hellfire can simply write off Matthew's gospel as irrelevant. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. No, but this different understanding of what Scripture is, in other words, as a witness to the way God works in the world, coming from people's own cultural contexts, that gives us some room to wonder about Scripture and to ask questions about these verses and to struggle and wrestle and, yes, even to disagree with Scripture. It's okay to do that. So with all of this in context, let's take a look at today's story, shall we? It's going to be fun. <laughs> so it seems like this story is all about forgiveness and what happens when we don't forgive one another. Jesus and a few of his disciples were chatting one day on the topic of promise of new life and how forgiveness fit into the picture. Now, in those days, I think I've shared this with you before, but this is worth remembering because this is a part of Matthew's context. Jewish rabbis used to debate about the number of times a person should unconditionally forgive someone else. And the answer they came up with went something like this. If someone commits an offense against you once, then forgive if someone commits an offense a second time, then forgive. If somebody commits an offense against you a third time, then forgive. 
But if somebody commits an offense against you a fourth time, then do not forgive. That was the limit of the day in Jesus' time. That was the rabbis, that was what they decided. Three times was the limit. That was the wisdom. So when Jesus started preaching about forgiveness, of course his disciples were naturally interested. In their minds, they kept hearing that old adage, a fourth time do not forgive. Three was the limit. The disciples knew that. Yet Peter noticed that Jesus never once repeated that old proverb three times only. In fact, he heard Jesus saying strange things, unprecedented things about forgiveness, things which contradicted what, was, what the old rabbis used to teach. Peter listened, and he wondered if he was beginning to get the picture. Jesus was pushing the limits, right? I mean, Jesus always seemed to be pushing the limits. So one day, Peter swallowed hard and went up to Jesus and brought it up. He said, Jesus, so if somebody sins against me, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? I mean, whoa, that was so radical. That was over twice as many as the tradition of the day. Seven times. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, No, Peter, I tell you, 77 times. So much for limits. But wait, Jesus said, sit down, Peter. I've got a good story to tell you. Jesus always had a good story to illustrate his sermon. So they sat down on the grass, and Jesus' story about forgiveness went something like this. There was a king who had a servant who owed him lots of money, lots of money, 10,000 talents worth of money. By today's standards, that would be, well, something like a gazillion dollars. Now, since the servant could not possibly pay the king back, the king decided to sell him and his family into slavery, a terrible life which often included sexual abuse. So the servant fell before the king, groveling and pleaded, be patient with me, O king. Give me some time to pay this gazillion dollars. Well, you heard what the king did. Overcome by compassion, the king pulled the loan document out of his filing cabinet, and with one stroke of his pen, he wrote off the servant's debt. Well, that servant left the office feeling overjoyed, as you could imagine, and that servant came upon another servant who owed him a hundred dollars. And what did he do? Well, he grabbed that servant by the throat and said, pay up. So the other servant fell and said, be patient with me, O oh, sir. Give me some time to pay this hundred dollars. But instead of showing compassion, he had that debtor thrown into prison. Now back at the palace, ooh, the king got wind of this. And he called his servant in for a good tongue lashing. You wicked servant. He said, I forgave your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant? Mercy as I had on you. And without another word, the story says, the king shipped him off to the torture chamber until the gazillion dollars could be paid. Now that's probably where the original parable ended. Before Matthew's interpretive comments about this is what God will do to you too. Isn't it interesting that the story, as Matthew interprets it, doesn't work at all? He turns the parable into some description of God. And in fact, what Matthew does with his interpretive comments at the end of this parable is he steers us away from what introduces the parable. That is, the story is supposed to be a sermon illustration about forgiveness, about forgiving 77 times. That's what Jesus encouraged Peter to do, forgive. And then he tells this story where nobody's forgiven in the end. I think Matthew's interpretive comments at the end about God being unforgiving are way off the mark. Because I don't think this is a story about the way God works at all. I think the story is about the way the world works. 
The story begins by the king, begins with the king giving a wasteful servant what he deserves. And you and I, if we feel genuinely sorry for the servant, he's blown, blown a lot of money after all, but he's a, a little servant and he's, you know, he owes to a big king, so why not give this guy a second chance? Just like the way we experience brief bursts of generosity sometimes. The king experiences a brief burst of generosity. But after being forgiven, that servant goes out and gives his fellow servant what he deserves. And then finally, the king hauls that servant back in and gives him what he deserves. <laughs> By the end of the story, there's no difference between the vengeful little servant and the vengeful big king. There's no difference. We might have thought the king was Mr. Nice Guy, but, but no. By the end of the story, the king repays injustice with punishment and with torture. This story is just god-awful. It's a story about the way the world goes round and round, high and low, up in the palace with the king and down in the valley with the servants and the little people. It's about the cycle of violence and retribution and punishment and getting what you deserve. It's a description of humanity at our worst. This story is a description of us. There's no difference between us and the angry king who doesn't forgive and the angry servant who doesn't forgive. Yes, we may have brief bursts of generosity, but by, in the end, we, and I mean humanity, we tend to fall back into this cycle of retribution and violence. You want to read a contemporary version of this story? Open your newspaper or, or look at your news feed. Sometimes when we read parables, we're, we're really tempted to reflect on them allegorically. We want each character in the story to represent someone or something. With this story, for example, we want so hard to think of the king as God and of the servant as the poor follower and of the debt as sin. Perhaps on some level, certain parts of the story could show these these readings, we could interpret it that way. I think maybe that's how Matthew interpreted the story as an allegory. Maybe the king represented God. But allegory can be so dangerous unless you give the story room to breathe on its own. Maybe in Matthew's mind, the king does represent God. But that does not mean that all of the details of the king's behavior can be taken about state taken as statements of God's character. Just as we do not regard God as a kingly despot who would sell a woman into sexual slavery as punishment for her husband's sins, so can I not take that concluding minor detail about unending physical torture as indicative of the divine nature. This story is not an illustration of forgiving 77 times. In our story, the king forgave once. This story cannot be an illustration of the nature of God, even if Matthew says it at the end. Matthew putting the words on Jesus' lips, I mean, as an editorial comment, an interpretive comment on this story. So why, why tell this story then? Like why, it, if it's a story about the way the world works, why would this be included? I wonder if maybe Jesus and Matthew wanted the disciples and followers to, to look at this story as a kind of mirror so that they could see themselves in it and that part of our human nature that gets caught in cycles of graphic horror and just how awful the world can get when we let that happen. Maybe that's why Jesus told the story. Or maybe Jesus was inspired by that part of the story um, which describes the generosity, that burst of generosity and forgiveness of the king. Maybe he thought that that 
personified some dimension of God's character. Because I would say that that generous moment of the king, yeah, that does describe something of God. For Christians, after all, forgiveness begins in the heart of God with God's relentless desire to have a family, to make us friends. We've been made a new creation. Just like we hear in the assurance of God's grace each week after we confess our frailties, not only our own personal frailties, but the brokenness of the world and the human condition, we confess that in our prayer on Sunday mornings too. We confess our selfishness and we confess our incompleteness. And then we hear these words or something like this, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old life is going away and a new life has been born in us and is being born in us and will be born in us. Those are life-changing words, man. Incredible words. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've messed up, no matter, as Courtney said earlier, what, what, we've, what we've failed to do, forgotten to do, no matter how many times we've hurt others or embarrassed others or ourselves, no matter how heavy our burden of guilt, we are forgiven. We're given another chance at life, like the green buds in that tree. We can grow again. The Christian faith is grounded in our being accepted by God, and that includes being forgiven by God. We put trust in the God who gives us another chance, in the God who has taken steps to ensure right relationship with us, the God who is so eager to bring us back into relationship with God that she came to, to live with us in Jesus Christ. That's how much God wanted to be with us. I'm thinking about forgiveness, how can you leave out the story of the crucifixion and what Jesus said when he was on the cross. God, he said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We're a new creation. We're changed. We're not the same people after we hear the words of the assurance of pardon. We're reminded every week that we are new people and we are forgiven and we are loved and we are free. But it doesn't stop there. I mean, once we acknowledge our, the restoration of our relationship with God, then we need to think about the restoration of the relationship with God's people. <laughs> Not only God's people, but God's creation, the whole creation. And when we take steps to try to heal relationship with creation and with one another, we are participating in the same creative activity as God doesn't that blow your mind? It blows mine. I want to come back to our story just one more time, the parable. Thank you, by the way, for journeying with me through this text. I think maybe this story is intended to be used as a mirror because it contains not only the absolute worst of human behavior, but also it contains the absolute best of human behavior. Right there, reflected in the pages of Scripture, we have the worst kind of human rights abuses you can imagine, but we've also got that beautiful moment of extravagant forgiveness, albeit brief, and yes, only once, but still it's there. <laughs> Perhaps it's a good thing that parts of the story inspire us and that other parts turn our stomachs. Because this parable shows us the way the world can be in, in both of those places when we choose goodness or choose not goodness, 
both of those things are right in this story. It shows us how awful the world can be when we dig in our heels, and it shows us how beautiful it can be when we tap into generosity and compassion and peace. What kind of world do we want to be a part of? What kind of world do you want to be a part of? What an abundance of ministries we have going on in and through Knox Waterloo and through our partnerships with, um, with the community and with the presbytery. Next Sunday begins Holy Week and we look forward to our Holy Week services. Lots of time and energy and special music and um, participation with the children and youth has gone into planning these wonderful services. Next Sunday is an intergenerational service. There, our playground will be here. There will be drama interaction. Our praise band will be leading us in some music, and it is going to be a great service with a parade and lots of waving of palms, and we really look forward to that service. It is not to be missed. And then on Thursday, on Monday, Thursday, we will be having a dinner, starting with a dinner, joining together in community in, in the hall. This will be a simple dinner of soup and bread and tea and coffee and beverages and dessert. And we hope that you'll join us at 5.15 for that. And, if, and, and you can kind of roll on in if you can't get here after work until 5.30 or 5.45. There'll still be enough time for you to eat. And then we're going to join in here for an intergenerational service with communion. And we will be um, participating in that sacred night just as Jesus gathered around the table with the disciples. And then on Holy Friday, the next morning, we will be having a, a service with a bit of a twist on the Stations of the Cross. It'll be the Stations of Peter, and we will be looking how Peter is part of, of the stories around Jesus' crucifixion. And we look forward to our Easter Sunday service. We'll have one in um, early in the morning at 7.30, um, meeting here and heading over to Waterloo Park for a brief service of um, story and song. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll be having 
a, a wonderful service with lots of special music from our chancel choir and from Full House Brass. So journey with us through Holy Week. We are continuing to try to make some partnerships and connections throughout our presbytery as well. And um, St. Andrew's Hespler is hosting a pizza and Ukrainian style Easter egg decorating night um, this coming Friday night. And there um, is some more information um, in This Week at Knox or on our, our youth um, social media. If you'd like to find out more about that, you can also uh, talk to me, but uh, maybe we can get a carpool of youth that would like to go down to participate in this great night and to get to know some other youth in our presbytery. Next Sunday after the, um, the Palm Sunday service, our youth will be hosting a bake sale to, to support and raise money for our upcoming youth retreat in April. And so uh, the youth and families and any of you will be contributing some baked goods and we'll be having a sale in the hall and you can buy something to eat right then or some food to bring home for Easter to share at your special family or friends gatherings. Um, and the prices will be marked, but you can also give a generous donation. Maybe there is a set of cupcakes that's worth a hundred bucks because they look so delicious, who knows? And that will support our youth retreat ministry. And if you'd like to give a financial donation, you can mark it specifically, send it into the office and mark it specifically as youth retreat. Um, our food bank challenge of the Sunday school kids is continuing and we're collecting food in the atrium in boxes. Specifically, the food bank has indicated to us that there are specific items that are highly in need in our community. So um, we thank you for all that you've given so far. If you give over the next couple of weeks, maybe you could give items of dry beans or rice, individual um, snacks like fruit cups or um, granola bars and such things as that. Um, this is one way that we can support um, food insecurity in our community. Our caring kitchen is starting back up again, and um, we'll be taking over the ministry that during the winter, um, it's, first, it's first United Church that does that, so we'll be taking that over, and we have teams on Fridays that make dinners and bring them down to a better tent city. Um, we could use some generous donations to support buying the food for this ministry. Um, so you could give money through the office or you can get in contact with um, Vaughn if you would like to volunteer to be part of this. About $150 yeah. each, each Friday is about $150 just for you to have some understanding of what the financial cost of that ministry is. And we continue our young adult gatherings that happen once a month. We're exploring an animate Bible series this year. And um, the next Sunday night from 7 till 9, we're going to be looking into genre and the rhythm of biblical text. And um, Jose Morales will be the video presenter that week. And he's actually a DJ. So thinking about... Um, scripture in that way and the connection to music and rhythm in that way. And we're continuing to collect our loonies or toonies or bills or whatever you'd like to give for Lent. And there is the jar set up in the south hallway just out here. And there's a fun runway. If you follow us on Facebook, you might have seen that. There's a fun runway that goes down the stairwell and smoothly puts the money into the jar. So if you want to have fun, you can go up to the top of the stairwell and try that out. Or there's a jar sitting on the greeters table in the atrium. If you want to put some money in that and the Sunday school kids will have fun doing that. We all come to worship with different questions and needs and leave with different answers and perspectives or maybe sometimes even more questions. Spending this time as community, this shared sacred story, singing holy song and translating this time into our lives is a core spiritual practice for many of us. Sharing our financial gifts is also a spiritual practice. 
Giving of our resources is one way we live out our faith and show that this community is a priority in our lives. You are invited to support the work and the life and the ministry of Knox Waterloo, the work of Christ through us and the mission and the service that goes beyond us. And you're invited to freely give as you can. be seated. We continue in prayer. Reconciling God, you took on human form to come live among us so that we might see you face to face and know your forgiveness firsthand. Yet somehow we find it so difficult to live in the ways of forgiveness, to break the repetitive cycle of unforgiveness. We pray for all the relationships and situations in the world that need to follow your path of forgiveness, for those who cannot let go of deep hurts, for families torn apart and needing reconciliation, 
for those who struggle to share space with those who have differing beliefs and ways of interpretation than them, for neighbors of different religious backgrounds who cannot find peace for those who punish present generations for the injustices of their past generations, for countries in conflict that struggle to find the way of peace, for political polarization within society that causes further division. Reconciling Christ, guide our efforts to bring about reconciliation, give us the strength to persevere without counting the hurts, and to find within ourselves the capacity to keep on loving. Give us the grace to be able to stand in the middle of situations, to be a conduit for the deep listening which can lead to healing and forgiveness. Help us to conduct ourselves with dignity, giving and expecting respect, moving from prayer to action and from action back into prayer. Grant that we may be so grounded in your love that our security is not threatened if we change our minds or begin to see a better way to act. Guide those who are called to reconcile on a large scale, politicians, world leaders, leaders of business, and those who stand in the midst of bitter conflict. O oh God, who has poured forgiveness abundantly into our lives, we pray that you might heal our brokenness, that, you might go, that we might go forth to be reconciled to those we have harmed. May you be with all those who engage in the sacred work of envisioning new wholeness, offering peace and a way of reconciliation, and bringing people and nations together. And God's people say, Amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn, number 632, Help Us Accept Each Other. As we prepare to go our separate ways, may we remember in our heads and may we carry in our hearts and in our bodies the reality that the, the God who made us and the Christ who mends us and the Spirit who molds us walks with us every step of the way. This is a miracle, it's a gift. And we give thanks to God. Amen.
I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshipping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox, who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.